Welcome to the Northville Church of Christ online worship service. My name is Michael and it's Sunday morning. Welcome to the New Jersey Shore. Let's start right off with our announcements. You've probably already heard that our sister Phyllis Caven passed away last Saturday and our condolences go out to her family. We're not sure of the funeral services or arrangements just yet, but as soon as we know, we'll let you know. Also, our sister Melita is still at home recovering from the coronavirus, so you might want to keep her in our thoughts and your prayers. Uh, also, if you're a member of this church and you're still having difficulty getting food or getting out to get food, just let us know. We would gladly help in any way that we can. I also want to thank the members who contacted us with uh, encouraging thoughts and suggestions about our worship service. Uh, I want to thank Debbie Robertson and Melissa White for the phone calls. It's very nice of you. Thank you. As well as Mark and Jean. Also, this week marks the final installment in our series of lessons titled Growing in the Knowledge of Jesus Christ. I look forward to this end piece. I hope you'll join us as well. Now, we have something new to announce. We've opened up an online electronic giving platform. We now have accounts with PayPal and Venmo. And if you stay with us after the services and after the closing remarks, I'm gonna do a little video on how to set that up if you wanna make your weekly contribution that way. And again, you don't have to. If you feel more comfortable sending your check to the building, that's great too. Also, if you're new and you're visiting us for the first time and you'd like to find out more about our congregation, if you visit our website at www.northfieldchurchofchrist.com, we have lots of information there for you. Or you can visit our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash northfieldchurchofchrist.com where our member Terry does a wonderful job of keeping that up. I think that's all the announcements I have. If you have anything next week that you would like me to announce, just get in touch with me. We'd be glad to do that. And now we're going to have a prayer to open up our minds to the worship service. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, church. As we prepare our minds for worship service, I would like to remind us that this is the third Sunday of the month. And in our evening worship service, we do our Barnabas notes. So I'd just like to remind everyone to reach out to our members and maybe text someone, send them an email, phone call, or just a note with some kind words of, kind words of encouragement. Will you bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, dear kind Father, just giving thanks for this first day of the week, dear kind Father. We know, dear kind Father, that you are the creator of all things, dear kind Father. I just ask that you just be with us this morning, dear kind Father, as we go into our worship service, dear kind Father, I just thank you for your mercy and your grace, dear kind Father. Just thank you for your son, dear kind Father, that he was willing to go to the cross on our behalf, dear kind Father. Just ask that you just be with us as we worship this morning, dear kind Father. I ask these prayers in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Our hymn before the lesson will be in moments like these. And if you have a hymn book at home, that's number 239. The title is In Moments Like These. And from the reading, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And that's from Psalm 18, verse 1. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice to the Lord, singing, I love you, Lord, singing, I love you, Lord, singing, I love you, Lord, I love you. In moments like these, I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands, I lift up my hands to the Lord, singing I love you Lord, singing I love you Lord.
We've come to the observance of the Lord's Supper, and we are to do this in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we gather about the table this morning, the table talk will be to benefit from the resurrection, each person must hear the message about Jesus and his resurrection, Acts 13, verses 37 through 39, and Acts 2 and 32, and verses 36 through 41. And each person must believe in Jesus and the resurrection and confess, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, and Acts 2, 32 through 39. And each person must repent of sins, Acts 2, verses 30, 32 through 39. And each person must be baptized into the death of the resurrection, Romans 6, verses 3 through 5, Colossians 2 and 12, 1 Peter 3 and 21, and Acts 2, verses 32 through 39. And each person must live a life of faithful obedience 2 Corinthians 5 and 15 and Colossians 3 and 1. This response will lead to the promised inheritance of eternal life based on Jesus' resurrection. 1 Peter 1 and 3, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 23. Will you bow with me as we give thanks for the price that was paid for us to have the inheritance of eternal life? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning just giving thanks for this bread, dear kind Father, which represents your son's broken body, dear kind Father, that was broken on our, our, on our behalf that we might have this inheritance of eternal life, dear kind Father. I just pray as we partake of this bread, it will be pleasing and acceptable, acceptable unto thee. I ask these prayers in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As we prepare our minds uh, for the fruit of the vine, let's remember what it represents, that shed blood on Calvary on that day, and just the sacrifice Jesus made for all mankind and for us today. Uh, let us go to him in prayer now. Let's bow our heads. Dear God and Father, as we humbly come before you this morning, on this first day of the week, we just give thanks and honor to you and honor to your Son, who was willing to go on that cross on Calvary on that day to do your will, Father so that we can have a, a chance for redemption, Father, to be with you someday in heaven. That's what you promised us. And because of the sin of the world, you had to send your son upon this earth to live a life as a man, but more importantly, to do your will and go upon the cross on the day of Calvary. And you just showed us that power over death, that death that conquers all. And now that he sits at your right hand, looking out for us as, your, as our mediator, Father, we give thanks for this also. Let us just... Think about the wonderful, merciful Savior that we have in Jesus Christ. And it's because of his shed blood on Calvary that it washes away our sin. We just give thanks for this emblem, this fruit of the vine in which we now partake. It's in Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Included at the Lord's Supper, but also separate is the giving. And if you saw the announcements, you understand that we have the electronic online giving. I won't dwell on that anymore. But we're asking you to either lay by in store or to give electronically. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. For thanks for our blessings. Our God, our Father in heaven, thank you so much for all that you've given us in these trying times. Thank you for the ability to bring forth this worship service to our members. And uh, we're just blessed to be here together around this Lord's table this morning. Uh, thank you, Father, for all that you've given us, including your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. We humbly offer this prayer now through Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Our hymn before the lesson will be from our hymn books, number 359, and the title is, I Love the Lord. I Love the Lord. From Psalm 18, 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. I love the Lord, for he died my soul to save. On Calvary, his dear life he freely gave. From realms above, Jesus freely came to die, that I might live someday with him on high. I love the Lord, he has been so good to me. He gave his life from sin to set me free. No great 
scripture reading comes from 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 through 8. For this very reason make every effort to add your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. This is Mark Syme, minister of the Northfield Church of Christ that meets at 2535 Shore Road in Northfield, New Jersey. I will be delivering the message of the morning. If you've been following along for the last seven weeks, you know that we have been in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. And as noted in this series, uh, the series is called Growing in the Knowledge of Jesus Christ. And as we have gone through, here are the things I hope that we have noticed. There are seven graces or virtues or characteristics that we've covered so far. Faith, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, and last week we talked about brotherly kindness. The spiritual construction, however, is not complete without quality number eight, and that quality is love. Now, uh, I can hear you saying, wait a minute, you talked about love last week. We took a trip to Philadelphia, but that was brotherly love. We are going to talk about a different kind of love that hopefully wraps up these eight qualities in a nice, neat little package and hopefully uh, really makes these viable for all of us. This uh, serves kind of as the epitome of Peter's uh, list of his graces is exalted above faith and hope in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse 13. Now there abides faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. And in the fruit of the Spirit, uh, in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, it's listed first in Paul's list. And so let's begin with a definition of love. 
And here's where it gets a bit complicated. And if you've been in the church for a while, uh, you know that there are lots of words in the Greek language for love. We talked about one of them last week, phileo. Phileia, or phileo, is the love of close friends. There's another Greek word called storge. Storge is the love of family. And then there is a word eros. Eros is that carnal type of love. It's the sexual type of love. This week, we are going to talk about a very, very, very special kind of love. I'm sure you've heard the word before. The word is agape. Agape is the love that seeks the highest good of others, not just friends, not just family, not just brethren, but according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, and we'll get into this part of the Sermon on the Mount, it talks about the love of enemies. And so it can be said of agape love that it, it doesn't depend on us loving a person and their having earned that love. It is not an exclusive love, brothers only, but as, as we have seen, it is an all-embracing love. It's, it's not an uncontrolled reaction of the heart, but it's a concentrated exercise of will. And finally, it's a caring love one which becomes involved in the needs of others. So perhaps maybe the best definition that we can give for agape love is active good will. Now, this love is best, uh, I guess, exemplified by the Father and the Son. God the Father demonstrated his love in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, where it says, while we were yet sinners, God sent his Son to us. God the Son demonstrated this agape love for us by laying down his life for us. And in John chapter 15 and verse 13, uh, the words of that is, greater love has no man than that if he is willing to lay down his life. And so truly, the Father and the Son have exemplified active good will toward all. Now, since the Father and the Son have done that, have shown that active good will, we should not be uh, surprised that Jesus expected this out of his disciples. And obviously, uh, as disciples of the Lord today, he expects it out of us. First, active goodwill or agape is necessary to be sons of God. Now, we have a, a group of verses in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 47. And number one, they show active goodwill toward our enemies. They say that if we want to be like our Father in heaven verse 45, then we will show this agape love. And in verses 46 and 47, it tells us that we'll be different than those who just love their friends or, or who just love those that love them. We will be perfect, and by that I mean complete, in the area of love and mercy, even as the Father is perfect and merciful. And so, Jesus expects us to follow God's example of active goodwill toward all. Second in this, it's a necessary component of Christian love. Now, I have kind of a whole list of this. In Ephesians chapter 2, there should be an atmosphere of love. It says that we are to walk in love. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14, it says we're supposed to kind of wear it like garments. We're supposed to put on love like we would put on a piece of clothing. In 1 Corinthians 16, 14, it is the motive for Christian service 
that our service be done with love. In Colossians 2.2, it says that it's kind of the glue that holds love together. It says that we are to be knit together in love. And finally, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, it is the controller of Christian liberty. Through love, serve one another, it says. And so every facet of our lives should be governed by an active goodwill for one another. That being said, it's very important for us to take an inward look at ourselves and see how do we develop this love. So part three is the development of love. First, let's let the Father teach us. Let's let God the Father teach us. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10, uh, Paul says, just as you, you Thessalonians, have been taught by God, and he goes on to say, how, and, and maybe the question, how does the Father teach us to love? Well, first, he teach us, teaches us to love by the very virtue of his character. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, God is love. God is love. And so if God is love, the Father is teaching us, you want to be like me. I'm love. And we can turn to the Old Testament into Exodus uh, chapter 34, verses 5 through 8. And it talks about his grace and his mercy and his loving kindness uh, and his abundant goodness. And they are all indicative of his love. And so by virtue of his example, God is love. And he showed us love. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, we're told that he sent his only begotten son to us. And that his son would become, here's that, that hairy word, a propitiation, a substitute for our sins. And so as the Father loved us, let us learn to love one another. Okay, so first, the Father teaches us. Then let's let the Son teach us how to love. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 16, it says exactly this, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. Jesus laid down his life for us because he loved us. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2, this scripture says to us, it says, walk in love as Christ also loved us. And so Christ loved us. Let's walk in that love. And finally, in John 13 and verse 34, Jesus says, love one another. Here, here it is. As I have loved you. So contemplate how Jesus died for us and will learn the meaning of of love. And so first we have the Father teaching us to love, and then we have Jesus teaching us to love. How about allowing the apostles to teach us to love? Now, Paul described what love is in this wonderful, wonderful uh, section of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. And, you know, we, we kind of know it as the love chapter, don't we? And, uh, you know, we, we read it at very often at, at weddings. Um, we read it when we want to get a real fit on what love is. And it says, love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. 
Love does not brag, and it is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take account of a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. And here it is. It says, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. And so this is what Paul tells us, what love is all about. He described it for us. And you know what? Paul thought that this love was so important that he prayed to various churches that he wrote to. Let's remember, most of the epistles of Paul, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, were written They were uh, letters written to churches. And so to uh, those churches, he literally prayed to them and prayed for them that they would love. For the Thessalonians, we find it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12. For the Ephesians, We find it in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. And in his letter to the church at Philippi, for the Philippians, it was Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. So, through very diligent study, through very, very diligent study, of uh, the scriptures that uh, revolve around love and fervent prayer. What we can hope for is that our love will abound more and more. And you know what? If the Apostle Paul prayed to the churches that he wrote to, that they would love, that they would show active goodwill toward one another. Shouldn't we pray that same thing? Shouldn't we pray that same identical prayer that we will love one another, that we will have active goodwill toward one another? If this is the most important thing that we do in our lives, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he ends it by saying, there abideth these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. In his fruit of the Spirit, Paul ranks love first. And in Peter's list of characteristics, here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, he uses love at the end to tie all of these uh, eight seven qualities together the way they should be tied together. And so, with that being said, how do we demonstrate our love? And so part four of our lesson this morning is the demonstration of love. How do we demonstrate our love for God. If you heard my pause, it was there for a reason, because that's a, a deeply contemplative question. How do we demonstrate our love for God? Now, some would think that this is something that must be overt. It must be uh, outward. I should get on a ladder, 
climb up on the top of my roof, get a megaphone, and shout it full blast to everybody in my neighborhood, hey, I love you guys. It doesn't matter that you come from different walks of life. It doesn't matter whether I'm sure that I like you, but God says I got to love you. How about a bumper sticker? How about that old honk if you love Jesus? How about doing whatever we think, whatever we think pleases God? You know what I have for those three? Hmm. Shout it from the rooftop. Put it on a bumper sticker. Do the things that I think will please God. I'd say to you, these are not the ways that we demonstrate our love toward God. Proper demonstration of our love for God comes with requirements. First, in John chapter 14, verse 15 and 21, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's obedience. He says, if you love me, you will obey me. How about that at the top of our list as ways to demonstrate to God that we love him? And two, loving the brethren. 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 to 21. When we love our brothers and sisters in the Lord, it reflects that we love God because our brothers and sisters in the Lord are walking down the same path toward glory that we're walking toward. So first, we need to demonstrate our love toward God. And secondly, we need to demonstrate our love toward man. Now again, 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, it begins with keeping his commands. How much love do we show for our brethren if our brethren look at us and say, look at the stuff that this guy does. Look at this. How can this person have love in their life if, if he carries on and does uh, uh, all of these things? He's not keeping the commands of God. And you know what? People are aware of that. And we need to make sure that we demonstrate our love by our, to our fellow man by keeping the commandments of the Lord. We need to make sure, and again, going back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, that we don't just limit it to friends and to loved ones because we expect our friends to love us back. We expect our loved ones to love us back. When we say, I love you, to someone very close to us, we have expectations of a, I love you, in return. Jesus says, we need to love everybody. And you know, isn't it interesting that uh, as we look at Jesus' life, that very often, Jesus, the one that loved so much, went to the unlovely, he went to the folks that the religious leaders of the day said, oh, he goes to tax collectors. He healed leper. Oh, that lame person, that blind person. Jesus hung around with people who needed him. And so um, love isn't limited to just folks that we have expectations of love in return. And then in John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18, we show this active goodwill by helping others with their needs. Yes, helping others 
with their needs. When we see the needs, we help. When I write my devotionals on Wednesday, I always write, make your little part of the world better. You just have a tight little sphere. Make that sphere in which you live a better place. Do we really love our fellow man? Then love in deed and love in truth. And so we have come to the end of our series of lessons on growing in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And hopefully we've learned a lot in all of this. Hopefully we learned that from the very, very, very beginning, Peter says, give all diligence to these eight characteristics. And it requires that we just don't stay stagnant. That we look at ourselves, okay, I got a faith, I'm okay. All right, I got a little moral excellence, I'm okay. We're supposed to grow in these. We're supposed to be building on faith. We're supposed to be striving for moral excellence. We're supposed to be increasing in knowledge. We're supposed to be controlling oneself every day. We're supposed to learn how to bear up under trials, not just the trial that happened yesterday, but the trial that may happen tomorrow. We're supposed to have a God-like nature to us. We need to be seeking to please God. And as we learned last week, we need to have that Philadelphia love. We need to be loving the brethren and showing brotherly kindness. And finally, as we sum this up this morning, we are supposed to show active goodwill agape love toward one another. And so I leave you with a question. Is the effort worth it? Indeed it is. For as we grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we become more like Christ. And that's what we are trying to do. And so, therefore, I pray that our study over the last 18 weeks has encouraged us to be diligent in applying these eight virtues to our lives so that we will have a Christ-like character and in an ever-increasing amount. And let's be mindful of how Peter closed the last letter that he wrote. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Verse 18, as he closes this letter, here's what he says. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to him be the glory both now and forever. And he says, amen to that. And we should all say amen to that. If somewhere during this week you have come to the knowledge that uh, you are not in the right relationship with God. If you've studied and you know that uh, you need to confess that Jesus is the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of your sins, someone here at the Northfield Church will assist you. If you need to confess your sins, please confess them one to another and confess them to the Lord. And if you do indeed want to become a member of the church that meets uh, 25 35 Shore Road in Northfield, we would love to have you as one of our members. I pray that we've all benefited from this study. I pray that during this uh, crucial time in our lives that we have never seen before, that you will stay safe and that you will stay healthy, but most of all, that you will stay within the bounds of your Christian walk each day. Thank you so much. As we close this morning's services, we're going to turn to our hymn books to number 705 if you have a hymn book at home. If not, the title is A Common Love.
It says, as I have loved you, you must love one another. That's from John, the 13th chapter, verses 34 through 35. A common love. A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. And our brother William will be closing us in prayer this morning. As we close out this morning, let us remember the message this morning to show love towards all. Will you bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, dear kind Father, with my head humbly bowed, dear kind Father. Just asking that you just be with us as we go out through the rest of this week, dear kind Father. I just ask that you just keep your loving arms wrapped around us until the next time we come together, dear kind Father. I just pray that everything that was said and done this morning was pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, dear kind Father. I just pray that as we go out this week, dear kind Father, we'll just keep your armor on, dear kind Father, and just keep you at the forefront, dear kind Father. And just be with the family of uh, Phyllis Caven, dear kind Father, our sister that we have lost, dear kind Father. We just ask that you be with the rest of our members and be with the churches of Christ as a whole, dear kind Father. I ask these prayers in your most in your son's most holy and divine name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us. We hope you found this service both inspiring and uplifting. Again, if you want to find out more about us, via our website at www.northfieldchurchofchrist.com. If you have any announcements that you would like me to make next week, just let us know. We'd be happy to do so. Stay tuned. I'll show you how to do the Venmo and PayPal in just a second. Have a great week. We hope to see you next week. Thank you. Hi, welcome back. Let's talk a little bit more about our online giving platforms, PayPal and Venmo. Now, if you go to our website and you scroll all the way to the bottom where the footer is, you'll see a little button off to the left that says PayPal and Donate. Now, if you hit that button, it's going to take you to a page that allows you to contribute to the church. And there's two ways to do it. You don't have to be a member of PayPal to do that. You can press the bottom button that says contribute with a credit card or a debit card, or the top button says to go through your PayPal accounts. Either one of those will work. Now, just to the right of the PayPal is Venmo. If you want my opinion, Venmo is the way to go. But here's a couple of things about Venmo. You have to have a smartphone in order to set it up, and you can only contribute through that smartphone. So you can open up a Venmo account either online or through the app. Most people do the app. It'll ask you for all your information that you want to know, and you're good to go. And when you're ready to make a contribution, we have an address, and you'll see it right here. It's Northfield Church of Christ. Notice that the N is capitalized and the two C's are capitalized. Uh, so you'll find that in Venmo, put in the amount that you want to contribute and pay. It's really simple once you get it done. So those are two ways that we now offer for you to do your weekly contribution. And if you don't feel comfortable, that's okay. You can still send your check to the building anytime you want. It. So I hope that works. I hope you find it interesting. If you have any problems, just contact us. We'll gladly help you. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week.